Thank you and good evening. I am Dr. Jill Bowen, Commissioner of the City of Philadelphia's Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, DBH, IDS. DBH IDS is proud to be here today on International Overdose Awareness Day to help this powerful film reach a wider audience. The opioid epidemic is tragic. It's heartbreaking to think about the lives lost, the families destroyed, and the communities impacted. But as the film makes clear, the power of language in communicating this tragedy is critical. This film highlights how opioids are talked about differently in different communities. Opioids can impact anyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, or background. They've been linked to almost 5,000 deaths of Philadelphians in the past five years. I want to thank the filmmakers, Richard Patterson and Seven Halsma, for helping people understand how widespread this epidemic is and making it clear that opioids are likely in your neighborhood right now, even if they're going by a different name. I wanna thank them for helping us understand that as a system, we must do more to educate communities and learn from them so we can begin to share a common language that can lead more people to treatment and recovery. The one element that struck me more than anything else in the film was the man who said, more people can tell you where to get perks from than where to get recovery from. I'm here to tell you that DBH IDS and the city of Philadelphia are ready to help people on their journey to long-term recovery. Start by calling 888-545-2600 for support and guidance, or go to dbhids.org slash MAT to learn about medication assisted treatment to help reduce sickness from withdrawal that can lead to relapse. You can also visit dbhids.org slash opioid to learn what the city is doing to battle opioids. But most importantly, you are not alone. We are here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowen, for your remarks. Now it's my honor and privilege to present to you the amazing and powerful short film, Opioids, a breakdown of the invisible overdose crisis in the black community. Please stay tuned after this film for a question and answer session with a panel of experts, the filmmaker and others. Thank you very much. Philadelphia. An equal opportunity. Now, weeknights at 10 on WTAF TV 29, Philadelphia. I was born into it. I started selling when I was 12. My mom was struggling to take care of six kids. My only means of supporting myself was working the block. Everyone was working. The block was popping and crack was heavy. In 2010, I was sentenced to three years. After my release, I came home. It was just a whole different atmosphere. A lot of the neighborhood addicts had gotten clean and crack was just disappearing from the block. Instead, all people talked about was perks. I was shocked to find out that almost everyone in my neighborhood was using them. It was the new drug of choice. I joined a re-entry program called Shooters at Ming Media and I was given a chance to pursue my passion in film. During this time, Ming was invited to present in front of the Pennsylvania Reentry Coalition. And during this conference, all I heard was opioids, opioids, programs for people on opioids, housing for people on opioids, treatment centers for people on opioids. So I asked my colleagues, what are opioids? They turned and asked me, what are Percocets? Right away, I knew what that was. It's confusing to me because the way the media shows it, all you see is white people living in tents under train stations. At the time, it didn't seem like a black issue at all. So what are opioids? The word opioids come from the narcotic opium, which is found in a poppy plant. It contains morphine, which can be used to make heroin, but it doesn't necessarily look like dope. People can get them with a prescription to treat post-surgery related pain and cancer. They could look like anything 
from prescription pills like Oxycontin and Percocet to heroin powder and fentanyl patches. You hear about them in songs like Mass Off by Future, Watch by Travis Scott. The big killer right now is fentanyl, a synthetic opioid. But the National Institute on Drug Abuse warns that it's 50 to 100 times more potent. A bad batch of dope could be laced with fentanyl. Nearly 60% of all opioids overdose deaths in 2017 were from fentanyl. Every day, more than 130 people in the U.S. die after overdosing on opioids, and more than 1,000 people are hospitalized for prescription opioid abuse. Now back during the crack epidemic, people were called dope fiends, crackheads, junkies, crack babies. Today we call them people with opioids abuse disorder. But people in my neighborhood don't even know what opioids mean. How are they going to get help if they need it? People in the black community are risking their lives and don't even know it because they don't understand the language. Y'all ever heard of the word opioid? I know it's a drug. How you know that it's a drug? Because my surroundings. It's opioids. What I know about opioids? Never heard of it until I went to jail. And what did you learn from it when you went to jail? I locked up and, um, as I said before, I was taken away from the pills and I went through withdrawal. And I had a, a celly that was on heroin and we basically was doing the exact same thing. Perkins is real bad in my neighborhood. I would say like, you know, maybe three in every five people take them. Kind of became the fad, like future, you know, you talk about drinking lean and popping perks and stuff like that, you know. All you got to do is turn on the motherfucking radio, put anybody, rap, DVD, in, any of that shit, all you going to hear them talk about is perks. See, if they knew about it, they wouldn't indulge in it. They wouldn't consume it if they knew about it, if they knew what opiate was. Do you think people in your neighborhood know what the word opioid means? I doubt it. If you ask 100, I'm going to say 98 probably wouldn't. And why you think that? It's just not talked about. James Rivers is a local Philly entrepreneur who was heavily affected by this crisis because he lost his sister due to an opioid-related overdose. I came across his story because he posted his sister's obituary on Instagram, which described the actual cause of death. It was a bold choice because that's not something you would normally see happen in a black community. It really made a big impact. Because of this, he is now a community activist focusing on bringing awareness of this crisis to the black communities. I guess the opioid crisis really affected me the most when I lost my sister. She was um, 25. She got a son that's eight years old and a daughter that's two years old. She got into the Percocets the same way I got into it. You know what I'm saying? The, the, uh, the neighborhood is urban, it's trending. Everybody want to try it, everybody want to be down. I'm not sure. I'm going to say her addiction probably had to be about three years. The, the, the part that really hit is when strangers walk up to you like, yo, you know your sister on this, or you know your sister doing this, or your sister getting high off this, your sister getting high off that. That's like when it really hit home. I reached out, I talked to her a lot of times. I tried to get her help. She was a single parent and she got her daughter, so I set it up with her though she could sign into a mother and daughter program in a rehabilitation center. The day of, she went out about 10 o'clock at night and she went and got whatever she got went in the house, laid back down with her daughter and woke up. She didn't wake up. Like when they woke up in the morning, she was just cold. And they called the ambulance and that's how they found the overdose. So after I got the phone call, my sister passed and it was just, I just wanted to take a different approach. Basically the overall message that I put in a bitch array was, you know, if you struggling with it, seek help because, 
we could save other lives by speaking on one life. The, the reaction was overwhelming. It was like, I got so many DMs, I couldn't even reply back to all of them. Like, from DMs talking about, I'm glad you shared your words though, so they can help another person and stop judging the way they do, all the way down to people who using the drug and affected by it, like, damn. Do you think folks in the community understand the language that is being dished out from the media about the whole opioid crisis? No, I don't. I really don't. I think in the media, they need to take like a different approach with it. You get what I'm saying? Because when they just be on the media like, oh, opioid crisis, the opioid numbers is going up, this, that, the third. When black people look at the news, they probably change the channel or something. Show the people who take the pills. Get some black urban people up there to let them know like, we all affected by the same thing. It's just in different forms, I guess. They could cut a thousand pills with fentanyl. One wrong batch, you'll be gone. That's like playing Russian roulette with a Percocet. It'll be one pill that'll kill you and you'll never know. If they knew that Perks was just the same, had the same addicted ways as hair around, a lot of them wouldn't take it. Because they see you the friend, now you tell somebody, okay, look, man, I got some hair around. You wanna go be high some hair around? You wanna snow some hair around? Wanna shoot some hair around? They be ready to rumble. Yo, man, I got some perk 30 since that 30, man, let me get a couple. You start off, you're taking five milligrams, then you jump up to 10, 15 milligrams, and after that, 30 milligrams, and you're paying a dollar per milligram, so 30 milligrams is $30. After that's not getting you high no more, most people can't afford $60 to get two or whatever the case may be, so they just backtrack to a $10 bag of dope, and then from there it's downhill. More people could tell you where to get some perks from, then they can't really get some recovery from. That's, that's the sad part about it, you know what I mean? Especially areas where it, it's high, you know what I'm saying? The epidemic is high. In certain areas, let's just be honest, like it's not gonna be the same here if, as it is center city, you know what I mean? I mean, they talk about like the good things about perks, but they don't talk about the thing, how you throwing up and you know, how you get, get sick, you get dope sick, you get, you know, cause at the end of the day, everybody get a choice, right? If you're gonna do it or you're not, I see, like, go the other way, like, don't do it. It's like, it's not worth it. It's not worth your future. It's a, it's like jumping down a rabbit hole, climbing down a rabbit hole. You're just gonna keep getting yourself deeper and deeper and deeper until one day you shrunk out out here on the streets. This Percocet thing is like, it's, it's not, it's not an old thing with us, it's new. So they, they don't, like, it's not, it hasn't been talked about. Like, we haven't been educated, we don't know. If you need them, take them. If you don't, and you need, and you're taking them, Know what you're taking. While working on this film, I've learned that people in my neighborhood feel a lack of awareness within our own community because the way the media covers the opioid crisis does not represent their reality. A guy from my block passed away from opioids and it wasn't much conversation on his actual cause of death. See, unlike James Rivers, most black people are embarrassed to talk about their loved ones dealing with an opioid addiction, which makes it harder to address the problem and find the help they need. This year, data research has shown that the number of non-fatal overdoses have been higher in the black communities compared to the white communities for the first time. Non-opioid related drugs are now laced with fentanyl, wet, crack, meth, even cocaine and many others. Combining some of these drugs with fentanyl has caused an increase in overdoses by 350%. Nowadays, counterfeit pills look exactly like Xanax and Perks, and they all lace with it. You basically can't tell the difference anymore. The only way to find out what you're taking is by using test strips. Cities and organizations are doing a lot to try to end this crisis. They are making sure treatment and medical care is available for those addicted, by discussing safe consumption sites, making sure Narcan is available, and giving training on how to properly use it for overdoses. With that being said, the national conversation needs to change. As a society, we can't talk about solutions if we aren't speaking the same language. Language is powerful. It could be the difference in getting help or getting left behind. It could be the difference in life or death.
During the pandemic, which overshadowed the opioid epidemic, the overdose death rates has risen across the country. The overdose death rates has risen mainly in the black community because of fentanyl being put into almost every drug, especially Percocets. That's why this film is important. So if you know anyone suffering from addiction or experiencing increased risk surrounding their use of substances, please visit phillynaloxone.com. The website will show you free training opportunities for overdose reversal and fentanyl test strip training, both with Narcan, Naloxone, and fentanyl test strips upon request. Current press releases pertaining to the spikes in overdoses or laced drugs can be found here. Visit phillynaloxone.com to learn how to safeguard a life. Whether you are looking for a traditional treatment, alternative recovery, harm reduction, or awareness information, please reach out. Addiction treatment is available 24-7 at 888-545-2600 to everyone living in Philly. Tonight's film, you know, Opioids, the Breakdown of the Invisible Overdose Crisis, um, we acknowledge, as was mentioned earlier, that today also is, you know, International Overdose Awareness Day. Um, first of all, we want to give you know, love, light, um, positive energy to all those who are in recovery, um, not only here in Philadelphia, but all those who are checking out throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, we know that the journey to recovery is one that is often, you know, fraught with challenges of the stigma with folks who have, you know, substance misuse uh, challenges, uh, folks who are trying to deal with the isolation that comes from family, friends, and loved ones. And so we wanna uh, definitely, you know, send our positive thoughts to those who are in recovery. Uh, if it's been four days, if it's been four weeks, if it's been four months, if it's been four years, or if it's been 40 years, we wanna say that your work uh, to do that is recognized. Uh, we see you and we understand how this challenges of recovery is the everyday process. Um, but that we can all get there together. And so that's our first thought. Secondly, we want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, you know, here at the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, our goal really is to promote the equity, uh, the inclusion, and promote communi communi uh, community dialogues like tonight so that we can all gather and really kind of delve into some serious themes that are affecting our neighborhoods, but also figure out some solutions and resources that we have at the department but also that you have people in our neighborhoods and communities. So thank you all for your input, insight. We uh, welcome you to put your thoughts, questions, ideas, and concerns in the chat. We have a colleague of ours who will be monitoring the chat uh, for questions. And we hope that you'll be able to you know, share any questions because we do have a dynamite panel discussion for this evening, which you hope that you will uh, be a part of. So I want to start by welcoming our panelists, and I have some questions for the panelists, and then we'll also provide some space for you all to share your thoughts as well. First of all, I want to introduce our filmmaker himself, uh, Richard Patterson. Uh, Richard Patterson, as you saw in the film, um, is somebody who came home from incarceration, uh, but really found a goal and a spirit uh, to be excited and to be uh, 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 ignited, really, um, towards filmmaking, which is really a story in and of itself, right? Um, we want to also thank our Senior Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at DBHIDS, Pamela McClinton, who has really been on the front line in this work uh, for several years, which has includes a, a task force with the mayor's office and also current work with work being done around opioids, not only in Kensington, but throughout the entire city of Philadelphia. We also wanna thank our colleague who should be on here as well, James Rivers. And we saw James's story uh, mentioned in tonight's uh, film. James has a very powerful story and hopefully we'll be able to gain some insight and takeaways on what James had to share about his story. And last but not least, uh, we wanna thank um, our final panelists uh, B. McFly, a.k.a. Brandon Chasting, somebody who was known as the sober messenger and motivator, somebody who was a person in the community with lived experience with opioids, 
uh, but more importantly, um, has a message to share about how you can get through with one's recovery. So we want to thank everybody for checking in. First of all, my first question is, you know, and I want to start actually with uh, Richard, if you can, uh, but I want to hit everybody with this question. Why do you think opioid addiction has been invisible in the Black community for so long? And if we could start with uh, Rich, if you could unmute yourself, that would be great. Hey, everybody, what's going on? Thanks for tuning in. But um, I believe that it, it, it went invisible because lack of information for the Black community. Like a lot of us don't know the word opioid or have used the word opioid because that's not, you know, it don't resonate here in the Black community. You understand? So it's, it's lack of information and it's just not knowing, you know? That's, that's my take on it. Definitely. Uh, how about for you, James, as somebody who also was in the film, you know, what's your take on, you know, why it's been invisible lot for so long? I think it's like the same as Rich said, lack of information. You know, in my neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhoods in the city, we are familiar with the word Percocets or Perks. So we consistently hear opioids, opioids. We, we're kind of going to look at it with ignorance and not really think it applies to us. So it got a lot with, you know, the way that they're coding it, with the language that they're using, and just people being honest with exposing, you know, the, uh, the depths. It's a lot of people that sugarcoat it and, you know, choose to not say nothing or choose to go with the route that people passed away in their sleep. So we're not bringing awareness that our brothers and sisters are passing away from, you know, using these opioids. We're going to keep looking at it ignorant and think it's something cool to do or something joyful. It's really not. Yeah, you know, Pam, you know, it's powerful what you just said, James, because, you know, Pam, and you've been doing this work for a long time through our DEI work at the office. When you think about some of the inequities and perhaps some of the challenges and disparities in our communities, does that come up for you when you think about why this has been so invisibilized in, in your view? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you to my brothers. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly as well. Um, but yeah, it's my opinion that, you know, it's the persistent invisibility of the Black community is really rooted in racial and economic disparities and implicit bias by the medical professionals. Um, here in America and across the whole entire world, the um, misuse and abuse of opioids in the Black community is no exception um, to the paramount uh, disregard um, to the Black community and communities of color as a whole. You know, so I, I would really um, root it in the fact that, you know, this goes back to uh, systemic and institutional racism and discrimination of um, the Black community, um, which then um, is attributing to um, um, inadequate educational systems um, and just uh, the dissemination of information flowing through the Black community to bring awareness to uh, this crisis and this um, opioid epidemic. And, you know, if I could just add, it really breaks my heart, you know, to see the, the growing numbers of uh, unintentional um, overdose and fatal overdoses in the Black community. Um, in doing this work uh, for years now, um, we were in the street, specifically in the Black community um, prior to the pandemic, um, just setting up shop, bringing our mannequin out, you know, showing people how to administer Narcan, putting Narcan kits in the hands of, of community members so that they had a fighting chance helping them to understand that fentanyl was laced in um, drugs of choice in the Black community, like marijuana and cocaine. Um, so it's just, it's just a devastating blow um, to our community. And uh, it's not the first type of devastating blow that we've experienced in the Black community for uh, lack of uh, information and lack of, um, lack of, um, information really being um, distributed and in a way that resonates with our communities. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pam, for that. You know, Brandon, I want to bring you in. Um, and obviously, you know, I first met you several years ago and 
we had you speak last fall at our International Men's Day event um, that was held. And uh, it was a fantastic opportunity for you to share you know, part of your story. Um, I'd love for you to talk a bit about your journey. You know, as you watch the film, first of all, I want you to check in on the first question, which is, you know, why do you think it's been invisibilized? But also, if you could check in with, you know, watching this film, what does it remind you about your own journey? And tell us about how you've navigated your own journey, um, if you could, bro. Thank you. First, I just want to thank uh, Department of Behavior Health, uh, Richard James Gabe, for having me, man. It's an honor, and I really appreciate it. Um, the word invisible, I believe that the word opioid and invisible, I believe that it's the opposite. I believe that people do know about the word opioids. I think, I think the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I think people do know about the word opioids. I just think that people try to manipulate themselves and not talk about it. Because I hear people being in the communities, I hear people using the word opioids and having even being addicted to opioids, right? I hear people using the word opioids. I hear people having debates about opioids and Percocets and knowing the difference. I just think that people are ashamed to speak about it. So it, it will kind of play like, sort of like, you know, I don't know nothing about it because I don't want to speak about it. So I do believe people do understand it. My, um, as far as my uh, recovery, I'm a proud recovering addict. Um, I've been addicted to opioids for 14 years. Now, when I got shot, I got shot one month right after um, I graduated from Lincoln University. And I, at that time, which was 2004, I absolutely didn't even know about Percocets. I never even heard of Percocets. So a week later, once I was, you know, discharged from the hospital, the doctor say, okay, I'm going to give you this um, painkiller called Percocets, take it every six hours or as needed. Never explain to me how addictive this painkiller could be. And once I took the Percocet, I fell in love with it because I'm saying, well, you know, this drug right here, why they don't sell this over the counter? So I was just ignorant to the word Percocet to what it is in 2004. And for 14 years of my life, it destroyed me. I went from taking it as pain prescribed to taking it for every pain, not understanding that I was going through withdrawal, right? Then I started taking it for recreational use. And then I found myself not taking it for recreation use. I was taking it for the mental pain that I was going through to, you know, just to clear my mind because I was going through a lot of trauma. Thank you for that, Brandon. And re that really, you know, really, I think sort of illustrates some of the challenges that we're dealing with. And more importantly, you know, what work is yet to come as we begin to organize around these issues and be able to provide services and resources um, in the city. You know, Richard, when you think about and when you hear Brandon's, you know, personal narrative, his testimony being shared, you know, 2004, 14 years of recovery. You know, I'm reminded of, of the thought that obviously when you were taking that camera around the neighborhood, you know, what were some of the lessons that you learned in making the film, right? Because I mean, I just learned a big one just now hearing Brandon talk about uh, the road to his recovery and what was happening in his neighborhood um, one month after graduation. You know, what were some of the lessons that you picked up as you were making the film? Now, coming home from prison, you know, Percocets wasn't even as round. It was, it was around heavy. It was around a lot. You know, I didn't know nothing about Percocets, nor the word opioid. And uh, going around asking my community, I wanted to hear what they wanted, what they had to say about it. And asking them, the answer I would get was, Oh, that's that's something that's in dope, you know, when really it is dope instead of being something in dope. So the answer is basically a, a, a incorrect answer. So really the, the community is 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 it I learned that it's a real big disconnect 
about the language we see on TV and about the language we use on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, basis. You know, so it is 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 it's a big disconnect. Yeah, 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 definitely. And I think, you know, one thing that you're talking about is the idea that, you know, one thing that we could think about is how do we make those connections to the young people? You know, we saw in the film how you uh, talked about some of the music and how it's shared a lot in the music. You know, Pam, if you could talk about, you know, what themes or scenes that came from the film that connect specifically to our work um, and what resources that we've had available that you've shared um, on this topic, that'd be uh, great for this as well. And as we're as you're sh uh, sharing that, please as well follow the, the uh, chat because we have great info in the chat. I want to thank our colleagues for reporting great info in the chat for you all to check out numbers, resources, and web links um, for you all. And the film will still also remain on the DBHIDS Facebook page, so you can please as well share it with your own friends, colleagues, and Facebook and social media network. But go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Gabe. Um... For me, Gabe, what resonated most for me from Richard's incredibly powerful short film, man, this is Richard um, Ashe to you, um, was the intersection of trauma and equities and, and, and community. Um, it's heartbreaking, um, but it's a sobering fact that the black in the black community, it, it is easier to get your hands on um, drugs than it is to access um, recovery treatment, quality education meaningful employment, safe and affordable housing, and nutritional food. For me, this film connects uh, with DBHIDS's diversity, equity, and inclusion guiding principles, which highlights the necessity for servicing um, Philadelphia's diverse communities based on their unique differences and needs and not um, servicing communities as if they're just one um, a homogenous uh, group of communities while still guaranteeing fear and um, full access to treatment services, resources, and um, to treatment services and resources, and, and welcoming the community's involvement in collective decision making processes, regardless of race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, religion, gender. Um, gender identity, sexual orientation, or abilities or disabilities. DBHIDS is an organization that is putting in the work uh, to ensure that it is actively and intentionally practicing its DEI guiding principles for the citizens of Philadelphia County. And we do it in a number of ways. We deal with our healthy minds fully because all of us um, are aware that you know, the historical trauma that impacts the Black community associated with the enslavement of our ancestors um, rears its ugly head today, even in our lives. Um, and then when you just think about the persistent and continual fear of police brutality in our communities and just the lack of asset, access to um, socioeconomic resources so we can advance ourselves and our families. Um, a lot of the drug use that we see happening in our communities is self-medicating because, you know, the associated stigma to mental health treatment in our community that's rooted in, in centuries and centuries of lies, you know? So I think that um, what DBHIDS has to offer with our opioid overdose uh, and our hand rescue training is uh, phenomenal with our distribution of hundreds, uh, probably at this point, um, over a thousand um, Narcan kits to the citizens of Philadelphia County. Um, we're just here with our trauma training, our um, network of neighbors to really help come in and um, help our families um, and the community as a whole um, deal with uh, the trauma of gun violence and, and death and murder in their communities. Um, I would just uh, really wanna highlight uh, to everybody who's listening today that may not be as familiar with uh, DBHIDS. Uh, we're serious about the work that we do. We're serious about the people that we serve. Um, 
and we're intentional to, to get this thing right with the input from the community at large. So um, Gabe, I hope I was able to um, yes. question. No, thank you very much. And again, we have some great conversations going on in the chat. And I want to thank uh, uh, Wendell Royster, um, good friend and colleague of ours, who actually asked a great question um, about, you know, uh, is Oxy the same as Perks? And I want to thank, again, this is tonight's about community, right? Tonight is about coming together as a uh, city of concerned citizens, um, thinking about this question. Right, and so no question is dumb, no comment is dumb. And it's actually, we want to thank you, Wendell, for for sharing that. But more importantly, I also want to share a uh, thank Malik and Peter um, for commenting and responding. Again, this is a space and a safer space um, for these kinds of brave conversations. Um, I only have a couple more questions, and then I want to actually get to the uh, community at large. And really, this is for Brandon and James. You know, when you think about what we've heard just now from Pam, as far as you know, what we're offering at the department, what has been offered with these Narcan kits, um, what more do you think should be shared as far as this vital information so that the Black community is made more aware of the resources and services? And how best do you think that we should do that? You know, is it social media? Is it presentations? Is it panels? Is it hitting the streets? Is it is it all of the above? You know, what have you seen? Um, that should work, and what should we perhaps be thinking about doing more of? We'll start with you, uh, Brandon. Um, that's a great question. I, when I watch the, um, well, I built my following based off of transparency, right? Um, I speak on mental health because mental health and drug addiction goes hand in hand. Most people that are using some type of drug the education on drugs, a lot of people don't even think alcohol is drugs, right? A lot of, to me, I, I feel like anything that alters your brain is a form of a drug. So alcohol, cigarettes, weed, um, opioids, anything of that nature is a drug to me. So a lot of people, when I'm on social media and I'm speaking on um, mental health, and how mental health and drug addiction goes hand in hand. Most of us are using after, after the time of partying and using it for recreational purposes, right? We find, I found myself using it from based off my mental pain, based off the things that I went through growing up, based off the things that I've started growing through as, as an adult while being um, addicted to Percocets. And I give people the raw, I give people the raw and uncut on social media. Um, um, and I get so many DMs and so many calls. And I get some people, I get people that say, you know what, I'm ready to get help down. And then guess where? I don't know where to take them. I just take them to the net and see if and see if it, it can work there. So we need more influencers that can tell you what do withdrawal mean and how, what type of withdrawal happens. And some people that just started taking Percocets, they may have not been through withdrawal. So giving them the raw uncut, like this happens, your back, constipation, throwing up, you get cold sweats, restless leg syndrome. Um, you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're crying, you're aching, pain. It's like the flu 10 times over and over, right? encouraging people, letting people know that it's okay to get help because in our community, we feel like getting help is a weakness. I felt like getting help was a weakness until I went to rehab. And um, I just think we just need more influencers because life is social media. We need more influencers, look for more influencers that's not afraid that live this life of sobriety sobriety means nothing you can absolutely i don't take anything because if i start drinking today it's a good chance that my drinking habits may turn into back to my drug of choice or i may just get addicted to just drinking so for me i have to stay away from everything i live a complete sober life so when richard said the language inside of the movie that makes all the sense in the world. It's hard for me to learn from someone that don't understand the language. 
And for me, I was addicted to purpose sets for 14 years of my life. It destroyed me. It made me a coward, a criminal, a deadbeat father. It made me all of these things in one. And for being clean for three years and seven months, now I'm saving lives. And I, I, the resource will be wonderful. If somebody come to me and say, yo, listen, where can I go? Can I go to this place right now? I'm on my way to come pick you up. I'm going there. Because it's a guarantee that they can help you. Let's go. Appreciate that, uh, Brandon. How about for you, James? You know, as you hear him, you know, what more should we be doing? You know, what can we connect with? What services or resources that you've seen that have worked? What are your thoughts? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, sir. Hurricane, I definitely think we need more people uh, stepping up. But I just want to, I want to speak on the, the mental side. I think the mental side is like the biggest part that my, uh, you know, in my sister's situation, I think the mental side played the biggest part. Because in the Black community, a lot of us, we use Percocets just to escape from things. And it's this thing where it's though, if you get on Percocets in the neighborhood, or if you get on Percocets from the hood, you know, you get affected by that. It changes your looks, it changes your appearance, it changes your approach, it changes how people treat you. So when we looking at these people, like our family members or whatever, if I got a friend that's heavily strung out on perks, I'm looking at him like, I don't want to be around. Him. You get what I'm saying? So it's like, if we just bash the people and bash the people and talking down, we never know what these people are going through mentally. So it's like, I feel like it's deeper than Narcane. It's like, we need therapy, more therapy, more resources to tap into people's mentals and really see what's going on with these people. Because I feel like with my sister's situation, she was bashed a lot. Like it wasn't really no help. It was just a lot of people talking down on it or making fun of it. You get on perks in the hood, ain't nobody gonna wanna be around you. Even if you're a female, your whole parents change. Ain't no men gonna be interested in you or none of that. So it, it puts people in a real, real bad depressed stage. And that just caused them to keep abusing, abusing, abusing the drug. And, the, and with my sister, it's like she barricaded herself from the world. It's like she only came outside when she went to go get that fix and ran back in the house. That's because everybody always pointing the finger and making people feel like when they own these drugs, they like the lowest thing in the world. And I just feel as though like if we had more people spreading love and tapping into these people and trying to talk to them and understand why they doing these drugs, I think it could be like, you know, a little better because that's like a major part in the uh, addiction is the mental side of things. That was huge what you just said, James. That was really powerful. Um, that really was, I think, key for us. And I think for us as practitioners, it's always important for us to do the main thing of listening, right? Um, I do have a question before I get to a couple of questions that I see also in the chat. And if some of our panelists can think about the questions in the chat, that'd be great too. But one of the questions that just came through to me was, and anybody can answer this, Brandon, Pam, uh, Rich, or James, um, I have a child that is currently having challenges with opioids, but they don't want to go to any type of treatment, what should I do? Anybody can jump in on that. Um, go ahead, Brandon. Is that you, how, Brandon? Yeah. Okay, okay so it, depending on how old the child is, because if the child, if the child is 18 and older, it's gonna be kind of hard to force them, even if you 302 them. And for those who don't know what 302 mean, is um, you know, calling for emergency and letting them know, listen, I have a person that's harming themselves. You know, they get high and they harm themselves or they could possibly harm others. The cops don't understand. They don't, when the cops come, they don't care. They gonna be aggressive if you're, if you're aggressive. Only thing they're gonna do is just make sure they take you to the hospital and that's it. But my second thing is, again, you have people like James, right? That understands that's on social media and been through this opioid addiction, whether it was with him or with his sister. You have people like me that speak on addiction all the time. So if they don't wanna to go to rehab, why don't we exhaust our, you know, resources, find people and, and, and show them videos speaking about 
because it is embarrassing, right? It's, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I feel weak if I got to go into rehab. Yes, I felt weak when I had to go into rehab. Then it's like, you don't want nobody to know. You're afraid if you tell a person you're going through something, they're going to use it against you. So like James said, this is mental health. So we, it, 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 you have to be an active listener as a parent, as, as a friend, whatever. You have to be an active listener. You can't always be aggressive and point the finger and say you ain't shit stuff. You ain't going to be nothing. Because guess what? That's going to make them use even more. Sometimes you got to be passive aggressive. Sometimes you got to be passive. And then sometimes you have to be aggressive. So it, it's just about finding those people that been through what that kid is going through and see if you can invite them over to eat or invite them over to talk or just show them, listen, I want you to see something. They were just like you. So hopefully that will help. Very, very helpful. Uh, uh, Pam, I see your hand up as well. Go ahead, Pam. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Brandon. Brandon, you know, that's some, that's great on point, you know, to the training on, you know, how you really deal with someone who is experiencing uh, a substance um, a use or a misuse uh, um, challenge. Um, and it's hard for, for loved ones and family members to, to experience um, someone they care about. It's heartbreaking, but you're right on the money. You know, it's really about, um, you know, showing the person um, that you care by talking to them when they're sober. You know, the last thing you want to do is try to um, initiate a conversation when a person isn't sober because if they're under the influence of drugs during the discussion, they're less likely to um, understand what it is you're saying. And by always showing love and support, I mean, that's key. Let the person know that you, you're you there for them. Just like Brandon's saying, people need to know that you love them and that you're not judging them or criticizing them. Um, your unconditional love will express that you have their best interests at heart and encourage treatment. Don't force it. Lecturing on negative surround, uh, negativity surrounding addiction will only increase a person's anxiety. Try instead to talk about the benefits of treatment and live in sober and, and offer help and, and resources and research treatment options um, with them and various community resources that are available. It's, it's really about, you know, three things, um, talking to a person when they're sober, um, showing them love and support and encouraging treatment, not forcing it down their throat. Like Brandon said, once you're over the age of 14, um, consent to treatment is your right and not your parents' right or anybody else's. And it gets even more difficult to support someone who's in need of treatment when they are adults. Um, so yeah, I think these tips um, go a long, long way and find support for yourself. Um, there are so many um, support groups out here for family members of people who are um, struggling and NAMI of Philadelphia is a great resource uh, to get connected for support. Now, I wish you all the best. Yeah, we're only gonna take a couple more questions and then uh, have our final closeout speaker by our deputy commissioner and think ready to kind of be on our way for the evening. But I do wanna uh, see hey, if we can Can I just add something, uh, Gabe? Uh, and just yes. wanna say this, we, we fund the Philadelphia Recovery Community Center. And you know, that's right there, 1704 Lehigh Avenue. And you just wanna stop in and be with some people who are also in recovery and, and experiencing, you know, their, their struggle in different ways and, 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 get some, and, and get some exposure to other folks, you know, who are in the struggle, then certainly, you know, you, you take, take advantage of the idea of going over to the recovery center. Take advantage of the idea of going over to uh, uh, some faith-based um, uh, 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 groups that are around Philadelphia, as well as some AA and NA groups that are around Philadelphia. Uh, they, you know, we, you don't have to have a treatment program in order to find recovery. Recovery is everywhere. And, 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 it's in, and it's in all of us. The opportunity to engage with someone else is an opportunity, you know, to, to, to really experience a miracle. And so I'm just saying that, that we need to be, be able to feel, feel comfortable enough within ourselves just to be able to sit down and welcome somebody into our lives.
Thank you for that, uh, Deputy Commissioner Roland Lamb. Uh, I actually want to bring in uh, an old colleague of, of, of mine and, and, and friend as well, uh, Malik, Malik Cooper. You know, I know that this is something that's been on you, you know, a part of your work. Uh, Malik, what would you say to that question as far as how people can, uh, what works, what hasn't worked, or what we could be doing more of? Thanks, Malik. Yep, no, no problem. Thanks for uh, for inviting me. This is great. That the film was dope. Uh, I, I live in Atlanta right now, but I I uh, I'm originally from Philly. I just had a, a, a simple thought with to the question um, about the teenager. Uh, if if that person does not see how their involvement with drugs or alcohol or whatever their drug of choice is, if they don't see how it's negatively impacting them. It's going to be a challenge to get them to change. And so it's like kicking up against a prick. It's like talking to a brick wall. So it's my experience that uh, they have to first see how their involvement with, with perks or oxy or whatever it is they're taking is negatively impacting them. Maybe, maybe is maybe Maybe they, it's causing them to spend up all their money or, or it's negatively impacting their health, but they have to see it first. So that, that's just what I wanted to offer. Thank you, Malik. And it's good seeing you uh, here live on the Zoom. Um, I want to also say, again, in my work with, you know, as the coordinator for our Engaging Males of Color initiative, you know, one of the things that we tried to do uh, is connect folks and particularly connect, you know, men and boys of color here in the city of Philadelphia to services. You know, I've distributed multiple cards. Our team has distributed the number multiple times. Um, you know, I also, Brandon, you know, you talked a lot about being that person that pulls up, you know, if a young person or somebody, anybody has a question or concern, I've been that person for a lot of men and boys here in the city of Philadelphia, um, as well as my, our team members. And so I know what it means to be a concern and caring um, adult for somebody else. And oftentimes, that's really what it takes. Um, you can always follow us. Um, thank you, Safe Star, for putting it in the chat. Um, our links for our Engaging Males of Color initiative and the work that we're doing around men and boys. Um, I know one of the things before we get to Roland, uh, I think our colleague uh, Stacy wanted to mention briefly about uh, CRS. And if you can, Stacy, if, if it's possible, um, I would love for you to be able to share a bit if you are able to get back on on live and just talk briefly about um, some of our other programs that you might be, be working with. Stacy also is our colleague here at DBHIDS. Stacy, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm actually gonna to defer to Peter Spade on this one. No problem, thanks, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. So the DBHIDS takes part in um, training for people in recovery, both um, with mental health and substance abuse or substance use disorder. There is CPS, which is Certified Peer Specialist, and there's also Certified Recovery Specialist. I will put um, websites to the training entities um, that we most often work with for both of these. I know that the CPS training is on hold right now due to uh, not having it in person. I think that there may be some CRS trainings and right now we're going through uh, the Council of Southeast Pennsylvania. So I'll put um, a link to their website up in the chat. Thank you very much, Peter. And I'm just going to make sure that I acknowledge and just run through uh, the questions just to make sure that we're good to go before we close. Um, and again, we thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. This has been really a fantastic conversation. We really want to thank our panelists as well. Um, this has really been delightful, but more importantly, it's been it's been really powerful, I think, to kind of talk about this work. Um, let me just make sure that we're good to go here. Again, thank you, Pam, uh, who shared a lot of information in the uh, chat, uh, particularly I see around fentanyl laced drugs. Um, one of the questions I saw, I believe also from, I believe, uh, forgive me if I'm saying the name wrong, but Shonika, um, how do I find out about information on volunteering with your organization? Um, I think that there's several ways. I think that uh, what Peter just mentioned as far as perhaps being a CPS or CRS is always great. 
Um, there are other volunteer opportunities, I'm sure, with Pam. Pam, you might want to share some uh, volunteer opportunities if you want, as I look through the final questions. Yeah, what I'll do is um, please um, capture my email address. I'm putting it in the chat right now. Please reach out to me so we can have a, a more extensive uh, conversation. Anybody who's interested in internship opportunities as well as volunteer opportunities with DVHIDS. So I'm putting my contact in the chat as we speak. Please reach Thank out you. to me. Definitely. James, I see your hand up. Oh, go ahead, James. You, I just wanted to um, touch bases again on like ideas to prevent. And I, I got this idea when somebody came in the chat and they asked about a younger person. A lot of this conversation is like based off of people who are already addicted to the drug. I want to talk about preventing these kids from being interested to doing the drugs. You know what I'm saying? Because we can stop a lot of people from being interested in taking these drugs instead of just talking about Narcan and things that, you know what I'm saying, when adults is already on these drugs. Now, the idea that I always had in mind was when I was a kid, they had the D.A.R.E. program. And the D.A.R.E. program went around to every school and they taught about drugs. They taught us what to use, what not to use. They played videos such as the film that Richard took time out of his life to create. They played these things at all types of auditoriums all over the city to, you know, to wake us up as youth, to let us know what's going on in our city, things that we shouldn't do, what we shouldn't do, the outcome of doing these things and things of that nature. So I just want to connect with some people and try to figure out a way where we could get this film to these youth to save some people from trying to get on these drugs. Because every day we got more records and entertainers and rappers coming out talking about drugs and just influencing people to get on all these drugs and Percocets and this, that, the thing. And I feel this though, we can stop a lot of this if we target the youth, because it's the youth that's coming up getting on these drugs at a rapid rate, I think, more than the adults too. Thank you so much for that, uh, James. I'm going to take one question. That James, um, that's you rate right on Kevin. the money. If I could just say that the DEA's office is uh, doing some youth prevention work around um, um, preventing drug uh, drug use and abuse. So that's one. But I would love to have a more extensive conversation with you about what. And I also want to say this tremendous amount of prevention in the schools that DBH IDS supports. So there's a lot to talk about. We probably spent a whole night on prevention as well. So I'm glad, glad it came up. Um, can I chime in on that, please? Is it possible? Sure, sure. Please do. Yes, on the um, kid mental health, on my take on it is yes, these kids are out here coping. A kid with a kid that's coping that's addicted to something with no parents around him or nothing like that. He he needs he needs attention. He needs he needs someone talking to him. You know, this film was created as a tool first. This film was created as a tool to be able to educate those who don't know what opiates are, who don't know where it came from, who don't know what's the effects of it. You understand? So Please, with that being said, let's spread the message that there are many ways that we could tackle the problem. You understand? We're trying to get people in treatment. Let's talk about getting kids to see something like this because it's real life and it's something they need to see. And that's all I need to see. Uh, thank you. No, I really appreciate that, uh, Rich. And, and again, you know, we really applaud the work that you did you know, to put in the time, the labor, the effort on this film. We know that this film is going to and has, in fact, um, changed lives for sure. Um, so one of the things that we saw actually in the chat before we go, then I'll get to our final thought. Uh, there was a question, and maybe I'll, I'll roll this one to Pam, but again, anybody can ask this question. Um, let me just pull this up. I believe this was from Brandon. Dorfman uh, from the Metro. Uh, so let me just make sure that we have it correctly so that we can go there. Um, yes, uh, Brandon Dorfman from the Philadelphia Metro here. The film was amazing. We talked a lot about recovery, but I was wondering if the panel could discuss uh, MAT. I, I wonder if Pam, if you want to maybe kind of jump into that a bit. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, um. 
yeah, MAT, medical assistant treatment. DBH IDS is doing some incredible, incredible work uh, around MAT treatment. Uh, we're doing some great work uh, in partnership with the Philadelphia prison system um, to really um, help those who are behind the walls and those uh, upon release continue their treatment. Um, we were contracted with the phenomenal organization NAT, for those of you who may know, who are behind the walls doing some really uh, intensive MAT uh, counseling. MAT is not only the administration of medication, but it's also evidence-based uh, therapy attached to that. So MAT is behind the walls at State Road uh, providing these services to uh, our fellow uh, citizens who are uh, currently um, incarcerated, and we're preparing them for ongoing treatment in the community of their choice upon release and, and continue to follow and track and support them um, through their journey of recovery. Um, and I don't know if uh, Roland, um, Deputy Commissioner Lamb, who spearheaded this uh, phenomenal initiative with the uh, Philadelphia prison system would like to add um, anything to what I just said. Well, I just, just, just this, that medication assisted treatment, we should, we need to, we need to change that last letter around from medication assisted treatment to medication assisted recovery. And the idea that people who are on, you know, who, who, who are able to, with, with the help of medications, you know, uh, achieve recovery is really important. The idea that we have, we have uh, thousands of people in Philadelphia who are on, on medication assisted you know, recovery, who are in medication assisted recovery um, and a number of programs around the city and who are doing very well. They're working, they're in school, they are you know, raising families, they're paying taxes. Um, and, and, and yet they go in some cases every day to get their medication. So I, I, I think that we have a, an opportunity here on a, on a much larger scale to invite folks, you know, to 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 in out of the cold, so to speak, you know, to find recovery, you know, uh, through medication, and I think we have an opportunity to work with folks uh, uh, throughout the city, you know, as, as we are, are, are already doing around, you know, uh, the idea of medication-assisted recovery. So I think that, you know, there there are opportunities that that we could that we can are going to continue to have uh, as as the technology gets better and as the medications get better. Thank you for that, Roland, because, uh, you know, part B to that question was, are medications discussed in the Black community, or are those conversations still not being had by many people? What would you say to that part of the, of the conversation? Well, I think that it, it's being discussed, but it's being discussed in, in different circles. Like, for instance, uh, Brandon talked about the fact that, that you know, um, uh, he had heard that, that, that the, the use of the term opiates. But, you know, there's, the question is, is what circles is Brandon, you know, uh, in? And as opposed to other circles where you know you don't hear, you don't even hear the term opiates, um, the idea that there are people who understand you know, who, who because they're exposed to it understand it, but there, there are other people who are, are are not exposed to it and don't have a clue as to what's happening. I think that we need to. This, this, I think this evening, this event, you know, points out the fact that having this conversation is why it's so important. For us to have this conversation, for us to have the input from folks around this around this this, this virtual table, so to speak, about the idea of recovery and about the idea of of, of, of drug use and, and what people are putting into their systems, I'm glad to say that we are actually working with the Department of Public Health to even to help distribute even more fentanyl test strips. And the idea is for us to get more and more people aware of what kind of drugs they are exposed to. And we we are we want to have these conversations. We want to actually, you know, encourage for uh, you know uh, uh, whether it's a, it's church groups, whether it's AA meetings or NA meetings, whether it's you know different kinds of, of recovery meetings that for people to have these discussions, for people to be talking about what it means to be in recovery and what it means to be to to be out there using drugs. And so for some of us, it's like playing Russian roulette. We don't know what it is that we're taking. And every time that we take it, we could we, we could very well be you know putting ourselves in a position to die. So I think that, that that these conversations need to be expanded so people can have access to these to these stories. I really applaud everybody you know in this room on this chat 
um, uh, you know, for their contribution and for their, you know, um, uh, caring. I think the reality is, is that, you know, the folks on this call, on, on this event, you know, really, really care. And they, and they want to, you know, get the word out and they want to be a part of, of telling a very different story. So instead of a story of death, a story of life. And I, and I really believe that we have an, op an opportunity here to have that story in, in, in a story of, of long-term recovery. Thanks, um, Roland. Real quick, James, if you can, real quick before we close. I just wanted to chime in on Roland uh, real quick about the language part. That's kind of why I uh, brought up the kids situation because I'm pretty sure nine times out of 10, if you go to any urban neighborhood in this community, Backs anybody under the age of 18 years old, what is an opioid? They're not going to be able to tell you what an opioid is. Every young youth from 18 and under in the city of Philadelphia, they only know one word, and that's Percocet. And that's because it's in every song, every rap song, and it's, it's promoted as the new thing. So this film, I feel like, is, is, is really should be added on to the school tour because they need to understand the language and learn the education behind this film. I really think it is 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 really for the youth. Can I say something real quick? Or oh, you gotta go. go. You gotta go yeah, then go real ahead. Real quick. No, go ahead, real quick. Um yeah, I agree, I agree with Richard and James. Um like I said, when I heard um Richard say language, like it, the kids have to understand the language of where it's coming from. So if it's a person that's coming in with a suit and tie or they look like they're about to take them away or they look like they're about to go to the juvenile justice center, it's going to be kind of like, it, it's like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's like, okay, here we go. You're really not trying to help me. So when you got a person coming in that's looking like them, talking like them, dressing like them, explaining to them, like, yo, listen, not only, not only am I trying to help you from opioid Percocets or however you want to call it, but I've been in your shoes. A lot of these children think that it, they, no, it, it never happened to nobody but them. So we can have all the programs, but we need new solutions for outdated problems. We need to figure out what new way. Yes, the movie is definitely a new way. Going in them schools is definitely a new way. And yes, we have to have influencers that can get next to these kids and adults and say, I've been where you've been at. Appreciate that, Brandon. Appreciate that. Real quick, um, first of all, we want to thank everybody for chiming in and being a part of this evening's conversation. We think that's really been a very robust um, honest, informative, and passionate conversation and dialogue. We want to thank everybody for being a part of it. Um, I want to thank Sean with You Are Storytellers for, you know, again, offering their great services, their great colleagues here at DPHIDS. And before we close, I'm going to give the floor um, to our Deputy Commissioner, our Roland Lamb. But again, I want to thank all of our panelists. Again, Pamela McClinton. I want to thank Brandon Chasting, aka B McFly, is available heavy on, I, on Instagram, you know, the Silver Messenger Motivator. I want to thank James Rivers. Again, we give our condolences to you and your family and to your um, ongoing uh, prayers, love, and light to you and your family. And we want to thank you, Richard, um, again, for having the vision to make the film, which ultimately brought us all here tonight. So thank you, and we hope to continue to spread the film um, in the future. But Roland, as we close, the floor is yours. Just want to say, you know, um, uh, then thank you to everyone. It's been a blessing. Uh, I want to thank Richard and Seven for their contribution in making this happen. I want to thank the Department of Behavioral Health and its Commissioner Jill Bowen, you know, for uh, supporting this uh, this effort um, and being standing behind it. I want to thank the panel and for, you know for the for, for your words and for your contribution. As I said earlier, I think that. The energy that you guys, you know, demonstrated and the and 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 the words that you guys shared, I think, is 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 really, you know, um, incomparable. The the bottom line, though, for us is this: we need to take this to a different level, to where everyone can have this conversation. Uh, I, you know, whether or not we want to have watch parties in in barber shops, whether or not we want to have watch parties in hair salons and in in our, in our 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 church meetings. Or uh, whether we want to have, you know, watch parties, just you know, in a neighborhood, 
The idea is for us to get more and more information to people in, in, in less and less threatening ways. We have an opportunity, people, to, be, to actually have a chance to, you know, communicate the message of this film to, you know, to, the, to everybody, to begin to understand the real meaning of, of what kinds of drugs that are out there, but even more so, the, the risk that people are in and the jeopardy that people are in. Uh, we know we, we are in we are in some, in some desperate times, and we have some communities that are living in some very desperate you know uh, conditions. And so I think that we need to begin to more and more give people the opportunity to find hope. Just remember everybody that the difference between today and tomorrow is hope. And so hopefully that you know we 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 can take this message out and we can share the hope you know with communities across the city. So I just want to say thank you everybody again. You're, 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 you're muted, Gabe. Yep, thank you, Roland, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. We also want to thank uh, Tumar Alexander, who although uh, wanted to be here this evening, he could not be here this evening, but we thank uh, Tumar Alexander um, and the entire Managing Director's Office who supported uh, this event. Um, they had some other uh, important emergencies to attend to, uh, but they sent their greetings and their uh, thanks for being a part of this dialogue. Again, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, have a wonderful evening and a great week. Take care.